In October of 2019, detectives with New York's Gloversville Police Department were feeling the pressure. A local young woman had vanished under suspicious circumstances, and multiple days had now passed without any sign of her. Perhaps worse, the case still had no clear direction, and what few leads investigators did have only appeared to be sending them on a series of wild goose chases. One thing was certain, though. Authorities were in a race against the clock, and time was rapidly slipping away. All of that would change, however, when authorities sat down with a witness who appeared to know more than he was letting on. At first, he was hesitant to speak up, but by the time the interview was over, he had revealed everything police needed to move the case forward. He had also made one of the most startling and disturbing admissions they had ever heard. At around 10 p.m. on the night of October 29th, 2019, Officials at the local police department in Gloversville, New York, received a call from a young woman. The woman sounded worried and said that she hadn't been able to reach her sister, 22-year-old Elizabeth Lamont. Elizabeth, who went by Allie, was usually in regular contact with her and other members of the family. However, none of them had heard from her for more than a day. She wondered if maybe Allie had gotten in some trouble or something and asked if authorities might have some idea where she was. A quick search revealed that there was nothing on file involving Allie and the Gloversville PD, though they offered to send someone over to try and check up on the 22-year-old. The sister explained that she wasn't 100% sure where Allie was living at the moment since she had recently broken up with her longtime boyfriend, but she was able to provide police with the address of an apartment on the south side of the city. Not long after this, an officer named Chad Simonson drove out to the location. When he did, he found the place cleaned out and vacant. While this wasn't officially cause for alarm just yet, the situation made Officer Simonson feel uneasy. His instincts would soon be proven correct when he returned to the station and learned that a second call had come in about Allie Lamont. This one had been made by a friend of hers named Jenny Young, who was insistent that she needed to file a missing persons report. Jenny cleared up the mystery about the vacant apartment, saying that Allie had actually been living with her and her young child at their place for the last little while. However, much like Allie's sister, she said that she also hadn't been able to get a hold of her for more than 24 hours. With that, an official investigation into Allie's disappearance was launched. After distributing a be on the lookout alert to law enforcement departments across the state of New York, Gloversville police began by going over to Jenny's house to ask her some more questions about her missing friend and roommate. Jenny stated that the last time she had seen Allie was the previous day, October 28th, when Allie was at work at the local number no. nine smokehouse and sub shop in nearby Johnstown. She had texted asking if she could drop off her phone charger. Jenny had agreed, driving over sometime late that afternoon. Several hours later, Jenny said she texted Allie asking if she needed a ride home since she didn't have a car. Allie never replied to the message, nor did she answer any other messages or calls from that point on. She also never came back home. By the next morning, Jenny said that she was concerned enough that she went back to the local number nine, thinking there was a possibility Allie might be there. She wasn't, and her manager said that he hadn't expected to see her because she wasn't scheduled to work that day. It was a few hours after this that Jenny had reached out to the police. At this point, detectives asked Jenny if she had any theories about Allie's disappearance. Was it possible that she had run off somewhere? Or was there any other reason she might have gone missing of her own accord? Jenny said that she didn't believe that Allie would have taken off without letting anyone know where she was going. On top of this, the pair of them had plans to take her kid trick-or-treating together on Halloween, which she said that Allie was looking forward to. As to where Allie could be, and for what reason, Jenny said that she had no idea. If something had been happening, Jenny stated that she probably would have picked up on it, or else Allie would have confided in her that something was wrong. After all, they had been friends since they were 13. But she said that their last interaction had been completely normal, with Allie laughing and joking around like always. 
At the same time that detectives interviewed Jenny, other members of the investigative team spoke with Allie's family. Their goal was to learn as much as they could about the 22-year-old's life, looking for anything that might explain her sudden disappearance. Allie had been born and raised in Gloversville and had attended Saratoga Springs High School. Despite moving out after finishing school, she had stayed in the area, taking jobs that kept her near her family and her small, tight-knit circle of friends. She was close with all of her family members, but especially her three sisters, who she considered the most important people in her life. Allie's parents described her as a hard worker and said she possessed incredibly strong character for someone her age. Her father, Sherman, in particular, said he admired the way that his daughter carried herself. She was quick to stick up for others and wasn't afraid to speak up if she felt that something wasn't right. At the time of her disappearance, Allie's family said that she had been trying to get back on her feet after a rough breakup a couple of months earlier. She had been with her boyfriend, Tyler, for about four years, but the relationship had ended on pretty bad terms. That being said, according to the family, things looked like they had really turned a corner for Allie in the last little while. She was saving up for an apartment of her own and had started dating a new guy named William. After listening to all of this, unfortunately, police weren't really any closer to understanding why Allie might have gone missing. However, at the very least, they knew there were now two obvious leads that they needed to follow up on. Though no one close to Allie Lamont seemed to have any idea where she was. From their conversations with her friends and family, detectives with the Gloversville Police Department had come across two names that they wanted to check out. These were her current and former boyfriends, William and Tyler. Detectives decided to start with William, reasoning that he was likely one of the last people in contact with the 22-year-old. Detectives drove to William's house, only to discover that he wasn't there. His brother told officers that he was actually out looking for Allie as well, and had been on and off since he discovered that she was missing. Police left a message with the brother, asking William to call them, then moved on to try and question Tyler. They arrived at his address, only to find that he wasn't around either. Deciding that they needed to keep going, investigators made the short trip over to Johnstown to visit the local number 9 where Allie worked. By this point, it was around 8 a.m. on October 30th, and the 48-hour mark of the 22-year-old's disappearance was rapidly approaching. Authorities were starting to get nervous. They hoped that they might be able to obtain surveillance footage, additional witness statements, or at least something that could help to point them in the right direction. When they arrived, detectives asked to speak with the same person that Jenny told them that she had talked to, Allie's manager, James Jimmy Duffy. An employee who identified herself as Jimmy's girlfriend, Kristen Gurotowski, said he wouldn't be in for at least another couple of hours. She gave the detectives Jimmy's cell phone number, as well as the number of the store's owner, Georgios Cacavellos. However, neither man answered when they called. For police, this was becoming a frustrating pattern. None of their potential suspects or witnesses seemed to be reachable, and they were beginning to wonder if it was intentional. Worried that they were losing momentum, Gloversville PD requested the help of the New York State Police, hoping that their additional resources could help to speed up the pace of the investigation. State authorities began re-interviewing witnesses and re-analyzing what detectives had uncovered so far, searching for anything that might have been overlooked. Meanwhile, Allie's family and friends stepped up their own search efforts, handing out flyers, posting on social media, and just generally trying to get the word out about her disappearance. While it's unclear how much of a role these efforts played in what came next, at the same time that more eyes were starting to be drawn to the case, police suddenly started hearing back from all of the people that they had been trying to contact, and they were able to sit down with both William and Tyler in quick succession. William told detectives that he and Allie had only been dating about a month, but that as far as he was concerned, everything appeared to be going well with the relationship. He was able to provide police with an alibi for his whereabouts on the night of October 28th, saying that he and a few friends had been drinking beers at a local cemetery and that he had slept over at one of their places. He also showed authorities his last few text conversations with Allie. 
They had last spoken early in the evening on October 28th, though the messages didn't seem to have anything to do with Allie's disappearance. The final message between them had been sent at 6.39 p.m., when the 22-year-old was still at work. When asked if he could think of any reason why Allie might have left of her own accord, William initially gave an answer similar to Jenny's. However, after thinking about this for a while, he said that actually there was something that police should probably know about. A little while before she went missing, Allie had confided in him that she was feeling depressed and she was considering checking herself in for mental health treatment. She had decided against this, though, saying that she couldn't afford it and didn't have health insurance. Understandably, the information that William provided was concerning. It became even more alarming when detectives received an update from the state police. A more thorough search of records revealed that this wasn't actually the first time that Allie Lamont had gone missing. When she was younger, she had run away from home several times. Most of these incidents had been minor and had been quickly resolved, but it was possible that something like this could be happening again. Of course, if it was mental health related, Allie could still be in serious danger, so the faster authorities could find her, the better. No sooner had authorities learned of all of this than they were pulled a completely different direction by their interview with Tyler. Prior to sitting down with him, they had also learned some troubling information about the ex-boyfriend. It turned out that Tyler had been in trouble with police several times. While most of these interactions were related to disorderly conduct incidents, one of them stuck out. It was a domestic abuse case involving Ali Lamont. It had taken place just a couple of months ago. When detectives asked Tyler about the situation, he said that yes, Ali had suffered minor injuries as a result of the incident, but that police had the wrong idea about what had happened. Tyler said that back in August, Allie had shown up at his place in a complete rage. She had found out that he had been cheating on her with one of her best friends, and it was actually her who had attacked him. Tyler said that the marks on Allie's body mentioned in the police report detectives had seen were from when he had been forced to restrain her. After that, he said their relationship was over, and he had blocked Allie on his phone and on social media. He stated he hadn't heard from her since then, and up until now had no idea she was missing. Investigators weren't sure if they believed Tyler's story, and they definitely felt that the timing of the disappearance so close to the domestic abuse incident was suspicious. That being said, they had no actual evidence against him, and as a result, had no choice but to let him go. The final loose end authorities wanted to follow up on was at Allie's workplace. They sent another team of investigators back to the local number nine, where they were finally able to make contact with the manager and owner of the business, Jimmy Duffy and Georgios Kakavelos. Upon walking inside, detectives noticed that the situation of the store was a bit chaotic. There were building materials all over the place, and on the front window there was a sign saying that the business was under renovations. Giorgio said that they were still open, but that they were in the middle of updating the restaurant's interior. The construction had been causing a few issues, and on top of this, they had recently been experiencing problems with their soda machines. Police said that this was no problem, and after explaining why they were there, asked the men if they wouldn't mind coming down to the station to answer a few questions instead. They both agreed, and were brought into separate interview rooms. Almost immediately, investigators realized that they weren't going to get anything usable from Jimmy. He was behaving strangely, and was quite clearly intoxicated, quickly admitting that he had a drug and alcohol problem. Still, he said that Allie was his friend and was adamant that he wanted police to find her. I'm an alcoholic and I'm a drug addict. Do not tell my boss. <laughs> we won't. Listen, I want you to find my friend. I want you to bring my worker back to work and I want you to sit there and return my life back to work. The interview with Georgios, on the other hand, started out a lot smoother. He said that he and Jimmy had both worked with Allie on the night that she was last seen. He remembered, because that was the night that the soda machines had first started acting up. Syrup from inside had leaked out all over the kitchen floors and had taken them forever to clean it up. Georgios explained that Allie was supposed to close with them that night, but she had ended up leaving early. 
He said she was complaining about having to help with the soda syrup cleanup, so eventually he just let her go home. He was annoyed because that day he had agreed to give Allie a $500 loan to help her with a new apartment she was looking for. Giorgio said that after giving her the money, she took off, and that was the last he saw of her. She was helping with the syrup uh, situation. She complained, she didn't want to do it. <laughs> she left around what time, do you think? Purity death. So she took the $500 at night, mm -hmm. and then left. What time she left? I would gotta say anywhere between seven and eight. She said, thank you, George. She said, thank you. Yes, okay. she said, thank you, George. I said, just be good. I yelled, just be good. And then she left. Just like they had with the other people they had spoken to. Detectives asked Georgios if he had any theories about what might've happened to Allie. Was there anyone he was suspicious of, or anywhere he could think of that the 22-year-old might have gone? In particular, they wanted to know about Jimmy. What was his deal? Could he have been involved somehow? Giorgio said that Ali was his best employee, and over the six months that she had worked for him, they had gotten pretty close. He began to think of her like one of his own children. But the more he learned about Ali's life, the more concerned he became about her. He had feared something like this might happen. As for what exactly had been the cause, Giorgio said it was hard to narrow down. Allie hung around some pretty rough people, and she had also told him about the abusive relationship she was in with her ex-boyfriend. Then there were the problems she was experiencing with her mental health. At one point, Giorgio's claimed she had said some pretty dark stuff about not wanting to be around anymore. But she was troubled, girl. Rough. See, it was rough. I tried to help her. I tried to be a father to her a few times. Her boyfriend was beating her up. I felt bad for her. Right. I treated her literally as a daughter of mine. Then one day she says to me, I don't want to be here. I had enough of this. I said, you, you mean you don't want to work anymore? I have enough of my life, she said. As for whether Jimmy could have been involved at all, Giorgio said he doubted it. He admitted that the manager had a bad side, but said that he was mostly a good employee. As far as he knew, Jimmy and Allie were friends. The one thing we never talked to you about is, do you think Jim had anything to do with this between us? I really don't think so. He doesn't have the goals. <laughs> like anything that harmed to her or uh, do anything to her or anything like that. They were friends. They were bodies. While detectives had no reason to doubt anything Giorgio's had said up until this point, something about this last bit of their conversation just didn't feel right. Jimmy had been acting very suspicious during his own interview, but Giorgio's really didn't seem like he wanted to talk about it. The more they pushed him, the more he seemed intent on sticking up for Jimmy. When investigators started asking Giorgio's about any conversations he might have had with his manager, or messages he might have sent him in the last couple of days, Giorgio started to become less cooperative. He agreed to show detectives some of the call records between them, but when they came across a 36-minute call and a message Jimmy had sent, Giorgios got visibly nervous. He refused to play any of the message unless he could go through it first alone, playing it off like Jimmy might have been discussing something racy about women, and that was why he was concerned. So keep going down, keep... Then there's a couple calls, James right there. This one's 36 minutes long. 36 minutes. You're the one with the information right now that can help us solve this. I'm not denying you the information. What I'm denying you is, is a lot of private, personal information. Is Jimmy a good worker? He's heavy, yes, he is. He has a, he has a, a bad side. He has a bad side. Are you sticking up for Jimmy? I don't get Why are you sticking up for Jimmy? Are you, are you, are you in what sense you mean? Like, maybe he had something to do with it and you just don't want to come forward? What's the conversation you had with Jimmy that day? I want to remember it first. Because if, if it revolves around women, I don't want to play it. Women? I said, I don't care. We don't. You think we care? I don't care. I know, but... I don't really care. I do. So you're not letting us listen. That's what I am taking it right now. I prefer not. After putting pressure on Georgios to no avail, 
Detectives decided to end the interview. They knew where they wanted to take the investigation next, but it would have to wait until the following day. On the morning of October 31st, nearly three days after Allie Lamont had disappeared, detectives with the Gloversville PD and the New York State Police made an unannounced visit to the home of Jimmy Duffy. Their plan was straightforward. They got there bright and early, hoping they would be able to speak to the 33-year-old before he had a chance to drink or take any drugs that day. Almost immediately after getting Jimmy down to the station, investigators could tell they were in for a very different interview. He was clearly sober and was far less aggressive than he had been the previous day. Still, he started off with the same story. He had no idea where Ali was and claimed that he was just as concerned as anyone else about what had happened. I want you to find her, okay? Trust me, I do, because I want my friend back, okay? Not only was she my friend, she was a hellfire worker that I can never replace. If something happened to this girl, you gotta tell us. Are you this guy that was around for an accident and like you feel awful about it, but you're about to tell us? Or are you this guy that. No, no, you know, bro, listen. No, you keep. Yo, listen, I told you. She was fired when I seen her last. I tell you this much, I don't know where she is. You know what I mean? For the next few hours, Jimmy talked in circles, refusing to say much more than he already had. However, slowly, cracks started to appear in his story. I don't, I don't know. Something went too far that night, and, and we're trying to figure it out. You have the answer to the puzzle here. I need to clear my mind, mm -hmm. okay? Eventually, Jimmy admitted that he was holding information back, but said that he had demands. He wanted to be sure that no matter what he told detectives, he would be able to walk out of there a free man. I want it signed by the DA. That everything that you guys leave me alone. I walk out of here, you put me on a bus, and I can go. I don't want to promise you anything I can't. That's why I'm talking to you. It's because she overdosed, and she's done this. I can tell you that we can get that. Obviously, she's chopped up into pieces. You know, we're, it's different. Police told Jimmy that they weren't going to promise him anything, especially since they didn't know what kind of situation they were dealing with, but that they would see what they could do. That's when his demeanor completely changed and he let out a laugh that disturbed investigators to their core. <laughs> After a little more coaxing, Jimmy said that he was finally ready to talk. What he revealed next was more twisted than anyone could have prepared for. Jimmy said that in the weeks leading up to Allie's disappearance, she had been causing problems at the local number nine. The owner, Giorgios, was under investigation for some tax stuff, and Allie had started to complain about some of his business practices. At first, it didn't seem like that big of a deal. That was, until Ali threatened to file a complaint with the state labor board. That's when Giorgios came to Jimmy, saying that they had to find a way to get rid of her. He worried that she was going to ruin him and the business, but he claimed he had a plan. Jimmy explained that on October 28th, they scheduled it so that the two of them and Ali were closing together. He said that Giorgios gave him a bunch of money to buy drugs and also bought him a case of beer. It was to help him to work up the nerve for what he had to do next. At around 7.30 p.m., after all the other employees had left for the night, Jimmy, who was now extremely intoxicated, had come back into the restaurant. He snuck into the kitchen where Allie was busy washing dishes, then attacked her in the head with an aluminum bat. Giorgios quickly joined in, grabbing some sort of bag which he used to choke Allie. Disturbingly, Jimmy said that the whole thing had been far more difficult than either of them had anticipated. When Allie kept fighting back, they resorted to taking turns hitting her with a small sledgehammer. They gave me $500 to do all these drugs. Mm -hmm. So that way I could 
build up the courage to do this. Bought me a case of beer, smack her on the head with a bat. He had a bag, started choking her. He then said, she's not going down, she's not dying. She started kicking and all, this, that, and the third. He said to go get him the little sledgehammer. Gave him the little sledgehammer and went over the sledgehammer. One each from both of us. When we continued to choke her for a while, she kept twitching. After Allie was dead, Jimmy said that they started working on covering up the crime. They had planned the construction at the business to coincide with the murder so that any kind of mess seemed less suspicious. But once again, they hadn't counted on how big a job this would be. Georgios went out to get more supplies, while in the meantime, Jimmy cut the lines to the soda machine and poured syrup all over the kitchen floors to mask the blood while he mopped it up. When Georgios returned, Jimmy stated that they loaded Allie's body into his car along with any supplies they used. This part was also completely improvised, with Jimmy explaining that they had driven around for what seemed like hours looking for places to dispose of all of the incriminating evidence. They opted not to use a local landfill, then scoped out at least two more unsuccessful spots before finally making a decision. They threw the aluminum bat into a pond about 15 miles east of Gloversville, near the intersection of Mechanic Street and Dean Long Road. A little ways up the road, they dumped the bags full of cleaning supplies and other evidence in the woods. The final stop was an additional 15 miles away, this time in the town of Malta. It was here, just off the Adirondack Northway, that Jimmy and Georgios dragged Allie's body out of the vehicle, abandoning it in another section of dense forest next to one of the number 13 on-ramps. Jimmy said that at first he thought this was the end of things, but that the following day, Georgios told them that they had to tie up some loose ends. The next night, they went back out to where they left Allie, this time carrying additional supplies. Jimmy said that once again, he was incredibly messed up on alcohol and drugs, but still, Georgios made him do all of the work. He claimed that if he saw Allie's face, it would haunt him, and at one point, literally began to throw money at him in order to get him to continue digging a makeshift grave. Once Allie's body was inside, they covered it with fertilizer, cement, and concrete blocks before filling in the rest with dirt. To try and obscure the evidence of digging, they covered the grave up with branches, leaves, grass, and whatever other vegetation they could find. Following his gut-wrenching confession, detectives asked Jimmy Duffy to take them out to the various dump sites he had described. He agreed, and they were not only able to recover Allie Lamont's body, but also the bags of evidence and even the aluminum bat that had been thrown into the pond. Like many other things they hadn't thought of, it turned out that neither Georgios nor Jimmy had realized that the bat would float. With all of this evidence, authorities brought Georgios in for questioning one final time. Though he didn't know Jimmy had confessed and had been taken into custody, he was nervous from the get-go and refused to say much. When detectives realized he wasn't going to come clean, they placed him under arrest as well. Yesterday, you didn't read my rights. The fact you read my rights today, that's a sign to me. You're taking the conversation now from our general to what he said versus what I said. I'm not going to do that without an attorney. Can I call my attorney first? Put your hands behind your back. Do you understand that? Yeah. You're under arrest. After their arrests, Jimmy and Georgios took drastically different approaches when it came to dealing with the impending murder charges against them. Jimmy continued to cooperate and eventually agreed to take a plea deal for second-degree murder. Georgios promptly turned around and blamed Jimmy for everything. He claimed that while he had helped Jimmy to dispose of Allie's body, he had only done so out of fear. He said he merely stumbled on the crime scene after Jimmy had committed the murder, and that had only participated once Jimmy had threatened him and his family. When the case went to trial in May of 2021, Georgios and his defense team appeared incredibly confident that their version of events would be believed. To give you an idea of just how confident, here's a statement from his lawyer, Kevin O'Brien, 
who told the media after learning Jimmy would be testifying for the state, quote, The government has bought what this drunk, self-serving crackhead has sold them to get a better deal for himself. Now the prosecutors will have to watch as I destroy Duffy and the government's case in front of the jury. As you might have already guessed, this comment did not age well. Over the next six weeks, prosecutors would present more than 700 items of evidence, in addition to Jimmy Duffy's damning testimony. He wasn't the only witness, though. In total, more than 60 people would take the stand during the proceedings, many of whom helped to fill in crucial details about the lead-up to Allie's murder. Among this group were several current and former employees at the local number 9, who said that they had witnessed the tension between Allie and Georgios prior to the crime. Contrary to what Jimmy had originally described as Allie just complaining and causing problems at the restaurant, other staff members said that Allie had been trying to stick up for her co-workers. Georgios had been paying people late and under the table, hadn't been keeping proper financial records, and had been refusing to compensate people for overtime hours worked altogether. She had threatened to file a complaint with the labor board if he didn't change how he was running things. Georgios' lawyers argued that he didn't actually care about what Allie was doing. He had owned several previous restaurants and had dealt with this kind of thing before. It certainly wouldn't have been enough to make him resort to murder. However, this was really only half the story. You see, while it was true that Georgios had dealt with employee complaints before, he had never been in a financial hole like the one he was in now. He owed more than $70,000 to the state of New York and more than $122,000 to the IRS. And this was part of the reason for his shady business practices. Prosecutors argued that Georgios knew that if Ali's labor complaint went through and an actual investigation into his finances were launched, it would reveal that he had been committing tax fraud. Also, while we're on the subject of Georgios' former businesses, according to sources we came across in our research, it seems that at least one of his diners mysteriously burned down at a rather convenient time when it wasn't doing well. He was investigated for this, and it was actually brought up at his trial, though it's unclear if the jury was allowed to hear this. Anyway, just as Georgios' lawyer had promised, their main attack was on the credibility of Jimmy Duffy as the state star witness. Georgios ended up taking the stand in his own defense, giving multiple days of tear-filled testimony in which he claimed that he loved Allie and that he only helped Jimmy because he was afraid for his life. Unfortunately for Georgios, his extremely emotional story seemed hard to believe after one particularly important piece of evidence was presented. It was surveillance footage from the Walmart where he had bought cleaning supplies on the night of Allie Lamont's murder. In the footage, Georgios could be seen casually strolling through the aisles before finally making his purchases. Among those were a car magazine and an Almond Joy chocolate bar. As you might imagine, Georgios had a hard time explaining these last two purchases. You know, since people in life-or-death situations don't generally stop to tickle their sweet tooth and pick up a bit of light reading. When called out on this by prosecutors, Georgios had the audacity to claim that he bought the car magazine for Jimmy Duffy. This fell flat, especially since Jimmy neither owned a car nor had a driver's license. Similarly, Georgios wasn't able to provide satisfying answers for why he hadn't tried to alert police to what had happened while he traveled to Walmart alone that night, despite confirming that he had his cell phone with him. On June 17th, 2021, the jury took just a few hours to find Georgios Cacavellos guilty of first-degree murder, second-degree conspiracy, concealment of a corpse, and tampering with physical evidence. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. At the sentencing, Ali's family members gave extremely heart-wrenching statements about the sense of loss they had experienced as a result of the heinous crime. Her mother, Krista, said that they had been robbed of a wonderful daughter, sister, and aunt while her father, Sherman, called Ali a, quote, good girl with a big heart who stood up for the little guy. He continued, quote, it is a terrible thing to think about every day. We are very changed people. I cry all the time. When given an opportunity to speak at his sentencing, James Duffy apologized to the Lamont family, saying, quote, 
Nothing I can say is going to bring her back. Elizabeth isn't coming back, unfortunately. So I'm just going to say I'm sorry. He was sentenced to 18 years to life, in large part because of his cooperation with police, and will be eligible for parole in 2037 at the age of 52. We cover a lot of heinous crimes on this channel, but I'm just going to come out and say it. Georgios Kakavellos is one of the biggest pieces of shit I've come across in a while. I'm not at all saying that I think James Duffy deserves to be let off the hook, because what he did was horrifying. But in my opinion, it's clear to see how Georgios manipulated his addiction for his own greedy purposes. The thing that gets me the most is that no matter what way you look at it, murdering Ali Lamont never would have solved Georgios' problems. At best, he was kicking the can down the road a bit. Because let's be honest, the IRS was coming for their money eventually. And as soon as they did, they were going to figure out that he was cooking his books. In the end, Allie was brutally killed because she wanted to try and do what was right. And she didn't want her co-workers to be taken advantage of. And that is a truly heartbreaking thing to think about. Before we wrap up, we'd like to take a second to give a huge shout out to everyone who has made it this far into the video. Seriously, thank you so much for watching. If you found today's upload interesting and informative, we'd be honored if you'd consider liking and subscribing, as well as hitting the notification bell and selecting all notifications to stay up to date with our latest releases. If you're looking for additional ways to help support the channel, we'd love to have you join us over on Patreon. Patrons get ad-free and early access to all of our content, as well as four additional stories per week for each of our Crimes of the Week and Crimes of the Week International videos. You can learn more at patreon.com slash crimezone, where you'll also find some of the fine folks whose names are currently on screen. All that being said, we understand that not everyone has the means to support financially, and that's totally okay. We appreciate every like, sub, share, and comment that you send our way. Once again, Thanks so much, everyone, and take care.